since their earliest days, as you may recall, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, known as the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel, we see God reaching out to mankind. Incredibly enough, God in Jesus invites us to come and join him on his mission. We don't go for him, but we join him on this incredible adventure of being an everyday missionary. And yet, if we're going to be honest, there are times in our lives where we struggle whether or not we can trust that God has actually called us. We are filled with fear and trepidation. Rebecca Pippert, in her book, Out of the Salt Shaker, put it this way. She said, Christians and non-Christians have one thing in common. They're both terrified of evangelism. <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that simple statement. Why are we so scared of reaching out to others I believe part of it has to do with misunderstandings, misinterpretations, and miscommunications of biblical truths. Let me share a few of these misunderstandings. For one, we sometimes tend to think that we have to have our lives together. We've got to clean up our act. We've got to somehow do away with all those things that drag us down before God could or would use us. And yet what I'm reminded in Scripture is that even the Apostle Paul said how he struggled with being both a saint and a sinner simultaneously. Of course, others of us may feel that before we share anything, we have to know everything. I need to have an MDiv, a THD, or a PhD in philosophy or theology before I can go and address people's questions about the gospel. And yet, I'm reminded that it isn't all our education where the power lies, but in the message of the gospel itself. Of course, in some cases, I've talked with people where they believe that either their life was too eventful or their lives were too uneventful. Let me explain what I mean. On the one hand, people will look at their lives and say, you know, I have always been in the church as far back as I can remember. I've had saving faith in Christ. I didn't go and live a wild life. I've kind of stayed in a particular path that was very positive. Can God really use my story? And the answer is, of course, that's a story of redemption. That's a story of God's grace. And that's a story of God's mercy that can have a profound impact on others. On the other hand, you might feel that your life has been too eventful. Maybe your life has been riddled by addiction, devastation, or destruction of relationships, and you think God could not use that story, but that's a story of God's amazing grace, His mercy, and redemption as well. It's easy for us to feel that we are ill-equipped to share the good news of the gospel, but what I want you to consider are these words from Bob Goff. He's an author and a well-known speaker. And in his book, Love Does, he says, God often uses the least qualified, most available people to get things done. In other words, it's not about your ability, but about your availability. God uses people who are simply willing to join Jesus on his mission and what I want to share with you this morning is the culmination of our four-week sermon series looking at five mission practices. And I believe that these mission practices aren't the only ones, but they're biblical, they're practical, and I think by the grace of God, they're very doable. And so what I want you to do is take out your sermon notes as we look at these five mission practices. They are seeking the kingdom, hearing from Jesus, talking with people, doing good, and ministering through prayer. So let's dive into the first mission practice, seeking the kingdom. In the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus shares these words, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. What is the kingdom? The Hebrew word is Malkuth, and in the New Testament, the Greek word is basilia, where we get basilica from, and it refers to wherever God rules and reigns. It also carries this idea with both a now and a not yet reality. We experience the inbreaking of the kingdom of God when the gospel message, that's the good news of Jesus, what he's done at the cross, is preached and lives are impacted by the power of the gospel. 
What I love is that when God opens up these kingdom opportunities, you don't have to manipulate them or cajole them to make them happen. God just is already working behind the scenes redemptively through the power of his Holy Spirit and through the working of the word to touch people's lives. When we begin to see that, we start to turn away from coincidences and we start seeing God incidences taking place. You see, the kingdom opportunities will often look like a human need. As somebody who's facing a crisis financially, relationally, spiritually, or otherwise. We begin to see as God sees, we begin to see the least, the last, and the lost. When we ask God to open up our ears, we start to hear the story of people's hurts, their hopelessness, and their heartbreaks. And we can begin to engage in their lives with a message of hope and healing found in Jesus. So my question is really quite simple. How are you seeing God at work in your life this week? Has God been opening up some of these opportunities to meet practical needs in people's lives? Here's a wonderful and moving prayer that I often ask. Help me, Lord, to open my eyes to see you, to see what you're doing, to see how you're touching and changing people's lives all around me. The second mission practice has to do with hearing from Jesus. I'm not talking about some sort of mystical idea of hearing. Rather, what I'm talking about is perhaps the most clear way that God continually has communicated and does communicate is through the Word of God, that is, through the pages of the Bible. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who has built his house on the rock. Do you realize the sheer power of being engaged with the pages of the Bible? Uh, this last week, I came across a study that so encouraged me and challenged me simultaneously. It was a, a study done about Bible engagement. It looked at, among thousands of Christians, how are they engaging with the pages of the Bible, and what they discovered was rather shocking and eye-opening, but also very understandable. They found that if people engage with the Bible one time a week, that is kind of like going to church, if that's the only time they engage with the Bible, it has negligible impact in terms of their thinking and a lot of their action. They found that if people engage with the Bible two times a week, uh, that it still didn't seem to have much in terms of like visible change in people's behaviors. But by the time people had a third time where they were engaged with the Bible, what they noticed, there was a blip, there was a jump, there was a, a starting of a change. But it was on the fourth time that everything began to change. There was a skyrocketing of positive things and a spiral for a lot of negative things. For example, uh, people began to stop drinking more than 57%. People stopped holding on to bitterness and anger in their lives when they started reading the pages of the Bible. Uh, people began to have healthier relationships. Uh, people's addiction to drugs and pornography went down dramatically as they began to consume something other than drugs or alcohol in the Word of God. And what they found was that there were positive things that went up. What were some of those positive things? More than 200% increase in sharing the good news of the gospel happened in people who began to actually read and engage the pages of the scriptures. They also found that many people started to volunteer probably 300% more than those who don't engage in the pages of the Bible. All that to say is this, that we need to engage in the scriptures. We need to be in the word of God. Here's an interesting comment. It's better to tune your instrument before the concert begins rather than after it has concluded. It's a real good idea for us to prepare our hearts by being in the Word of God so that when those opportunities that God opens up with other people happen, we have the powerful message that we've hid in our hearts that has impacted our minds and has touched our lives. And don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that devotionals, that Christian books, or listening to podcasts can't be a powerful resource, but please hear this. There is no replacement for being in God's Word on a regular basis, day in, day out. Whether it's going through the book of Proverbs for 31 days, 
days because there's 31 chapters. Or maybe it's uh, reading the Gospels where you see Jesus' words in red letter and you begin to seek to apply them to your lives. Whatever the case may be, when we begin to ingest this word, this living word of God, it transforms us and changes us on the inside out. And I want you to ask this question, what has God been teaching you in this word this week? Here's a great prayer. Help me open your word daily and to listen to you, O oh God. Mission practice number three, talking with people. As you may recall, in last week's message, I told you about the different ways that Jesus interacted with people in his conversations. And what he did is he was open, he was honest, he addressed real life issues, he didn't blame or attack people, but he did speak truth. But he did so in a loving way. Why? Because he has compassion for people. His conversations came out of compassion. Listen to these words recorded in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. When he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus has compassion on people, and that drives him to conversation. I really like what Pastor Greg Finke said in this book, Joining Jesus on His Mission. He said this, Jesus can do more with two people who are talking than he can with two people who are successfully ignoring each other. I really think this is such a key idea here, is are we busy talking about people down the hall, or are we talking to people face-to-face -face about real-life issues? Are we taking time to listen to people when they are asked the question, how are you doing? Do we actually care? One of the great uh, theologians, Fred Rogers, incidentally, for those of you who don't know, he actually was a Presbyterian pastor, and this is what he said, it's hard to act like a stranger when you know someone's story. When you've heard where they've come from, this opens up the door to really communicate God's love in a simple and practical way. Mission practice number four, doing good. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we read these words, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You might want to circle that word workmanship. It's the Greek word poema, where we get the English root for poem. It's sometimes rendered workmanship, handiwork, masterpiece, or work of art. Have you ever thought that you and I are created in Christ, that he has a plan and a purpose for us to do good work? John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, wrote about doing good in his life. He said, and I quote, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, for as long as you can. I think those are good words for us to apply. You don't have to do something big to make a big impact. You can do small things that have a big impact and influence. So, what good can we do that will make Jesus' love tangible to the people around us? Here's a prayer. Help me to put my words and my attitudes into action, Lord. I really appreciate the way that Mother Teresa put it. She said, and I quote, not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. Are there some small things that we can do that can make an impact in the lives of others a fellow a pastor of mine in the Lutheran church, he said these words to me. He said, it's important that people see Jesus in us before they keep hearing about Jesus from us. He's, of course, not saying that we shouldn't speak the gospel, but what he's saying is that our lives should be a compliment, should be an expression, should be an outgrowth of the grace that we've already experienced in our lives to others. And this leads me to the fifth and final mission practice ministering through prayer. Writing to his young protege, Timothy, the apostle Paul shares these words in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made to all people. One of the most powerful ministry experiences I have ever had in my entire life 
has always been centered on this idea of praying for people. But I've got to be honest with you. I was really nervous and intimidated when I first started to pray out loud with other people. I would break out in a sweat. I would feel knots in my stomach. And uh, I would shake a little bit because I just didn't know what to say or how to say it. But what I have discovered is when we begin to have good conversations with people and people start to become vulnerable and they start opening up, instead of saying, I'm so sorry to hear about your suffering, that's uh, uh, tough, better luck next time. Instead of saying something like that, I will always say, I'm so sorry to hear about that. Can I pray right this very moment for you and for your family going through this crisis in your life? In literally hundreds of times that I've done this, uh, whether it's in front of LA Fitness, it's uh, at the corner bakery or Starbucks or uh, across the way at the Vons or even up the way here in front of Target, I've had many times when I bumped into people and I've simply prayed for them and they have encountered, I believe, an inbreaking of God's kingdom, a little bit of the touch of the King of Kings in their hearts and lives, and it has impacted people who see us as Christians praying for other people who are hurting, who are hopeless, or who are going through hang-ups in their lives? Are we praying for people? Sometimes we feel like our prayers aren't all that good. Listen to Max Licato's words on the subject of prayer. Our prayers may be awkward. Our attempts may be feeble. But since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers make a difference. You don't have to have a long prayer. In fact, Luther once made this remark. He said, the fewer the words, the better the prayer. Sometimes we don't have to say very much at all. So are you asking, how can we help you in prayer? Can I pray for you? And are you praying this day, this week, this month? Help me, O God, to pray for and with those who need you and not just for myself. It's a powerful tool in the mission practices, seeking the kingdom, hearing from Jesus, talking with people, doing good, and ministering through prayer. So do we seek the kingdom? Are we opening up our eyes to see what God is wanting to do in and through our lives? Are we noticing the needs of people all around us? Are we hearing from Jesus? Are we in the Word of God? Are we regularly exposed to the Scriptures? Are we talking with the people already in our proximity? In other words, God has placed people in our particular region, in our place, in the places that we study, the places that we play, the places that we worship. Do we do good for those all around us? Are we trying to do some good in a world filled with bad? And finally, are we ministering through prayer to others around us? I also want to add one other thought. When you're walking around in your day-in, day-out life, notice this, that life is what happens to us, right? Life is hectic, but your hectic life is your mission field. I really want that to settle in uh, because that's absolutely profound. If you begin to apply this in your heart, in your life, your hectic, busy life, as you are trying to keep your head above water and you're trying to keep the head of your family above water, where God has placed you is your mission field. Do you understand that it is not a suggestion to be an everyday missionary? It is a command. It is a call And God has given you the power, and he's transformed people's lives. Now, this is something you need to understand. You don't change anybody's heart. I can't convert a single person, but God, through the power of the Spirit, through the working of the Word, changes hearts. This day, will you join Jesus on his mission? I'm not asking you to go for Jesus because you don't do his work. But what I'm saying is, will you join him on this mission? Will you be an everyday missionary where you go out there and share the good news because there are people who are literally dying without Christ? This isn't just a a pleasure cruise. This is a rescue mission. There are people who need to hear the message of the gospel. And your life, 
You have people that are in your sphere of influence that need to hear about Jesus. And if you don't take that opportunity, you're missing out on a life-changing adventure that will change you and foreseeably change others for an eternity. God's calling you to this mission adventure. Will you join him? Will you join Jesus? Amen? Let's link our hearts together in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this.